okay so now that given you some background so the, what 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 until now what you should have understood is this relevance of this topic i'm going to make you watch few more uh, videos and look at some of the uh, documents that have been generated more recently about this topic uh, but for now, I think this is good enough to watch the video on the pizza delivery and on uh, social dilemma and the great hack. But I've given you a good sense of what is happening around us. There are a few other very interesting documentaries that have been produced recently, uh, which we'll watch later uh, in the semester. Now, what? let's shift to what is privacy itself right definitions of privacy i asked you to say what privacy is for you but now let's take a look at uh, what are the formal definitions of uh, privacy that are, are out there so this definition of privacy uh, so everywhere if you see uh, this so throughout the lectures all videos, all slides, which has this particular symbol, uh, means that you, I'm, I'm, I will use the document that is there cited in the slide also for discussion. I would also recommend you to go take a look at it. I will open it and show you some right parts for the discussion, what I want to have as part of the slides. Uh, but for you to get a better understanding of the topic, I think it will be very, very nice if you go actually read the uh, document that I'm referring to. So look at the definition what uh, is given in this paper, which says privacy is a value so complex right um, so complex so entangled in competing and contradictory dimensions so engorged with the various and distinct meanings that I sometimes despair whether it can be easily addressed at all so look at the words that, uh, yeah, so and that's why I was giving you earlier the understanding of think about your own privacy, talk to your parents and see what their privacy is, um, right? So these things, if you do, you will get a sense of, wow, wow. because I, I think the, for example, right, the topic about, let's take your parents are sharing the information about you getting a job or your brother getting a job or a sister getting a job to somebody saying, oh, my, my daughter finished uh, this program and uh, she, she just got into a job. And the next question somebody would ask or your parents will be happily saying that, oh, the package is so much, right? So is that, is that uh, okay to share? Probably if you ask your parents, they're going to say that, oh, we are excited, so we want to share. Uh, but if you look at it from your point of view, uh, probably the expectations are different, right? So that's why it's complex, entangled, competing. Competing because our own privacy, your own privacy expectations are going to be changing either in different contexts or when you change, your, for example, let's take, I'm guessing many, many of you would be in the age group this again generalization uh, many of you would be in the age group of let's take 17 to 25 now listening to this lecture uh, some may be beyond or probably some may be lesser also uh, but but your your own privacy expectations would change right what you thought when you were like 13 to keep private is not what you're thinking right now when you're 20 and it's definitely not going to be the same when you're going to be 30 or 40, right? So, uh, the contradictory part is also there, which is you yourself will argue what you said now uh, as, as a 17-year-old uh, person uh, later, which being different. So, let me just show you the report. Um, 
So this uh, is the report that uh, I, I had it in the slide, which which shows that it is three uh, concepts of privacy. Uh, the first concept, uh, privacy to the creation is knowledge. The second content connects privacy to dignity, and the third connects to privacy to freedom. So I think this idea of uh, uh, privacy, right, which is right to be le let alone, right to be forgotten, all of these themes will come as part of this uh, class, uh, which is what I wanted to highlight as part of this report. So here is one text that I will let you to read yourself uh, to understand the complexity of the definition of privacy itself, okay? Given that it's a video, you can pause it and read it also, uh, right? So this is what I, uh, is a report that I thought I will actually highlight. This is what we'll do as part of the, uh, as part of the slides, wherever that image is there of, of the paper, I'd go back to the uh, report and uh, see uh, which aspect. Uh, uh, some aspect of the report I'll walk you through and then we'll go back to the slides again. Control, uh, so continuing with the definition of privacy, uh, what we will do now is uh, we will uh, uh, look at control over information. This is another definition of privacy which was given by uh, Alan Weston, uh, which, is, which says that privacy is the claim of individuals or groups or institutions. Keep that in mind because I think it's not just about us as individuals expecting privacy, right? To determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. Each individual is continually engaged in personal adjustment process in which he balances the desire for privacy with the desire of disclosure and communication. It's, it's it's just arguing, continuing to argue the point that I'm saying about uh, it's complex, it's difficult to define, and we are changing our definitions of privacy as we move forward. Uh, Western also created this four states of privacy, uh, which is solitude, uh, intimacy, anonymity, and reserve, which looked at uh, solitude means uh, individual separated from the group and freed from the observation of other persons. It's, it, this is basically, look, I, I, I don't want to be involved in any uh, discussion. I just want to stay alone. Uh, this is what solitude means. Intimacy is individual is part of a small unit, which is they are there. Let's take if you're three friends or four friends, information just flows only between you and you're very, very close to each other. Anonymity, the point that I said we will also look at later in the semester is that individual is public. Anonymization is the idea where I want to share information, right? Want to be public, but I want my re-identification, which is me, to be actually avoided. That's the idea here. Individual is public, but still seeks and finds freedom from identification and surveillance. Right. Reserve, the creation of a psychological barrier against unwanted intrusion, holding back communication. This is very similar to solitude. Uh, here, I just don't want to share information. I, I want to be reserved, kept away from uh, uh, any any kind of discussion or intrusion. Now that we have seen the four states of uh, uh, privacy uh, from Alan Weston, let's look at few other par definitions of privacy or states of privacy or the words that people have used, researchers and uh, faculty and others have used for the word for privacy. So this is uh, Daniel Soloway's privacy taxonomy. Uh, so he uses the word information collection, information processing, invasion, and information dissemination. So for all the um, uh, 
documents that I'm referring, I either have the URL here, and when whenever there is a uh, sort of an image like this in the slide, it means that I'm going to be going to the document also and using it for conveying some points. And it's also referring that uh, I would recommend you to go look at the document also. I will only look at some parts of the document, but it will be actually very nice for you to read the document also. Uh, so what is uh, Solovey's privacy taxonomy, right? Information collection. Why information is being collected? It could be for surveillance, it could be for uh, interrogation, keeping the privacy in mind, that's what this point is. Uh, information processing, you collect a lot of information, uh, CCTV feeds in your cities, you may have seen what are they doing, they are actually doing uh, aggregating the information to see whether the same person is moving from one point to another point. Uh, these these uh, CCTV feeds can be used for uh, tracking people, uh, knowing something that happens, uh, uh, un unpredictable things that happen or some crisis that happens, these kind of CCTV cameras are used uh, to find that, right? Identification of people, let's take if somebody is lost, uh, can you actually use the CCTV feeds to track the person and find the person? Let's take if it's a kid uh, who's lost, right? Some secondary usage of the processing uh, information that is being collected and processed also. Invasion, intrusion, decisional inference, can, can, can the information be used for taking some decisions against us, right? Facebook, Facebook using the information for us uh, uh, that, that they collected from us and use it somehow against us. Right. Against us, meaning in terms of, let's take, um, uh, selling selling some uh, life insurance policies or even some malicious entities actually using that information against us. There's been incidences in the past where Facebook post has been used to kidnap people, right, because the whereabouts of the person is being posted on Facebook and therefore that information is used for uh, taking, uh, uh, kidnapping uh, the kid, kidnapping uh, people. Information dissemination is a breach of confidentiality, disclosure, uh, exposure, uh, increased accessibility, blackmail, all of this if you see self-explanatory words, uh, but because of information that is being shared, uh, you can actually look at these things being used. So here is the uh, here is the actual document uh, from where uh, I, I took this uh, taxonomy, uh, which is if you look at private. So I'm using these documents. I'm also going to convey some other points that probably is uh, important or interesting to know about. In this case, it talks about uh, privacy is a product of norms, activities, and legal protections. Privacy is not merely an individual right, it's an important component of a flourishing community, right? So we, we saw this kind of a theme earlier also, which is privacy is not just about individuals, it could be about groups, it could be about organizations, it could be about a community, that's what this uh, uh, emphasis is. Right, so data subject is us, our information is being processed. So if you look at uh, the, the taxonomy that I showed earlier in the slide, is basically taken from here. And this describes each of the, um, each of the parts of the taxonomy here in detail. Uh, so none of these activities are inherently bad, right? So which is the, taxonomy part, which is information collection, processing, uh, invasion, and information dissemination. None of them by itself is bad, nor is privacy inherently good, right? The interest that sometimes conflict with privacy, free speech, security, transparency, and efficient consumer transactions are all quite valuable, necessary, right? As, as consumers, we want protection. Consumers, we want recommendations, right? 
uh, we must balance the value of privacy and conflicting interest to determine which should prevail in any particular situation, right? So this coming back again, earlier I told, told you about control of information, which is the same thing. So, so one question that I would like to actually have a sort of say some sort of, sort of a discussion in the mailing list is also is about so so let's take let's consider Facebook, YouTube, all of them seem to be profiling us, right? So they know what videos do we watch, they understand uh, what posts that we are actually liking, they actually also know which friends do you talk to most frequently. They know all this, right? So because of this, they can actually profile us and say that, oh, you're a cricket cricket fan and you like Sachin Tendulkar and therefore you should probably like the new ad that Sachin Tendulkar is showing up. Let them show the ad to us, right? So these kind of things are happening. Profiling is by itself a problem. Creating that information about you, knowing that you like this book, knowing like knowing that you like this cricketer is by itself is that good or bad it's a question for you let's discuss it in the class uh, in the mailing list right so i would highly recommend uh, you to take a look at uh, this document as as and when possible so next let's look at western's privacy indices so what is this uh, western's privacy index what did western do uh, Western over a period of 30 years or so asked the same kind of questions, right? Similar uh, topics, for example, internet privacy, telephone privacy, general privacy, these kind of topics that he took. He created questions and asked the same questions in statistically representative sample across the US for many, many years. And how is this useful? This could be useful to say that, okay, what are the perceptions of people of privacy over the years uh, of a particular topic, right? Very interesting. I mean, I think there are even contradictory views about how helpful these uh, surveys are, but we can get to that later. Uh, for now, the Western's privacy indices are about finding out what US citizens think about the concept of privacy different types of privacy, for example, and classifying the users into fundamentalist, pragmatist, and unconcerned. This is what he did. He did this to uh, look at US citizens um, and, and ask them questions and collected data for many years. And this is a report that was written on top of, so to say, 30 years or 25, 30 years of data collection by Weston, uh, which compared what did he do and how did he actually come up with the classification. So this is the, this is the report. Right. Let me go through quickly, not necessarily in detail of all of them. Again, uh, I will leave you to take a look at what is, uh, if you're interested in. Uh, so this is basically looking at 30 privacy-related surveys between 1978 and uh, 2004. As I said, they looked at different types of privacy, for example, consumer privacy, uh, information privacy, particularly health here, right? different aspects of privacy. I'll show you some questions that he asked also. So Western classified the public into three categories. Uh, Western has interchangeably used the following categories to refer to the groups of people that are high and fundamentalist, medium and pragmatist, low and unconcerned. These three things will come back uh, in, in looking at what, what classification did he do. So one of the, one example here given is that, uh, so he looked at whether they are very concerned about threats to their personal privacy, whether they agree strongly that business organizations seek excessively personal information for, from consumers, whether they agree strongly that the federal government, since uh, Watergate, is still invading citizens' privacy, 
whether they agree that consumers have lost control over circulation of their information. So this is a set of questions that you would uh, he asked and then depending on the answers for these four, he would actually put them into high, medium and uh, low, which is if, if there were answers of three or four privacy concerns, answers from the above four questions, he would put them as high. Then if it's only two, he would put them as moderate. If it's one uh, or no privacy concerns at all, he would put them in low. And these high, medium, and low are relevant to the fundamentalist and pragmatist and unconcerned. Generally, simply to think about it, some questions were asked. Depending on the answers that the questions uh, had, uh, the, um, the users were classified into uh, three different categories. Here are the definitions of uh, fundamentalist, pragmatist, and unconcerned. The fundamentalists are generally distrustful of organizations that ask for their personal information, worried about the accuracy of computerized information and additional use made of it, and are in favor of new laws and regulatory actions to spell out privacy rights and provide enforceable remedies. So essentially, these are people who are uh, going to be uh, strict about what the information they are sharing. For example, I have some friends uh, who don't show up on pictures when you take, right? We go to conferences, we meet up uh, in places when we try to take pictures. They're not interested in standing the picture they would offer, saying, that, oh, can I actually take the picture and not really be in the picture? One, one sort of say behavior of this fundamentalist type of people. Pragmatists or pragmatic is that they weigh the benefits of them of various consumer opportunities and services. Right. So these are a set of people who are not really, so to say, uh, super worried about their privacy, but they would actually make the judgment depending on the situation. Right? Okay, can I? Should I give my cell number? So let's take if I give the, they're saying in a in a point of sale of a of a product that you want to buy or a shoe or a shirt that you want to buy. Uh, they say that sir, give you a number, and we'll give you 10 10 percent discount in the bill. Is is that something that the user wants to uh, you want to decide? And particularly, you can think about it, okay, like if, the, if the bill is about 500 rupees, will you do that 10%? Or if the bill is like 50,000 rupees, will you do that 10%? Right, so that's the uh, pragmatist view. They believe that the business organizations or government should earn the public trust rather than assume automatically that they have it. And again, uh, uh, a characteristics of a pragmatist. Unconcerned is that the unconcerned are generally trustful of organizations collecting their personal information, collecting with the existing organization procedures and uses. So this is a set of people who think that, look, I think organization Facebook is doing good, Twitter is doing well, government is collecting my information, all of that is good. Nothing is a problem. Actually, this, this set of people may even think that I have nothing to lose. It's okay that if anybody has access to my information. That's the category of unconcerned. Right. So one of the things that you want to know, putting a thing that will be very consistent across this class is also that understanding all of this is helping in making informed decision, right? You, you or any user that we educate through the process is making the choice, making the decision, using that information that is provided, privacy policy, informed decision. Please read the privacy policy. The privacy policy says something, make a choice depending on the uh, information that is provided in the privacy policy. 
Uh, here, if you see high concern moderate for 1990 and 1991, the difference is here, which is 46 percent and 41 percent, 36 and 39, 17 and 20. So essentially, the proportion keeps changing between high, low, and medium, uh, in depending on the year, depending on the topic that is studied. Also, there's a table later uh, which gives the exact values for many of these years and many of these topics also. So, this one if you see, uh, it just talks about general privacy concerns, what the distribution is, uh, consumer privacy concern, what's the distribution is high, medium and low. Uh, so, so this would give you a sense of and this, this kind of data has been very helpful in making policy decisions, right. Uh, what kind of uh, what kind of solution should somebody build in terms of consumers should be should organizations be uh, requested or mandated to uh, have this uh, card which can help understand who the customer is uh, and then use that to make decisions on what products they're buying right so these kind of things should that be allowed, should that be not allowed. This has been done uh, um, for, for many years, so there's a lot of data to show uh, the user behavior in the US at least. Right. So that helps uh, get a sense of uh, uh, quantitatively what is the user behavior, what is the user perceptions in rather than user behavior user perceptions and attitudes because there's lots of situations that the question talks about and depending on the situation how users behave is used for uh, collecting this data. I hope that helps you to understand what uh, Weston had in mind and how he kind of classified uh, US citizens in terms of these three categories. All right, so that's Weston's privacy indices. And if you look at overall, generally if you take the um, average across many years that the data was collected. So fundamentalist would be about 25 percent, pragmatist about 60 and unconcerned is about 15 percent. One curious question that you can ask is can, uh, how, how does these, uh, how does these numbers look for India? And that's something we can ask. Uh, you can, you can probably ask these questions uh, for a large set of people and get some numbers which was tried before. Um, so, in 2005, a study was done to understand uh, quantitatively what people think about privacy. This was a very small study in terms of number of users, about 400 people uh, filled the survey and there was an um, um, interview study also because I think there's multiple methodologies that you can collect data, right? For example, uh, one could be just interview, uh, just me uh, meeting somebody and asking them qu questions and you can actually get some 10 people together called focus group discussion um, and then you can do some survey send the questions online now to get some people or physical get people to fill uh, and then you can get some people on the lab to study lab uh, get people into the lab and make them do something and then study depending uh, on the you and on the decisions that they're making how they behave you actually study what they think about privacy right and then there is this real world study or it's also called as field study, let's say. So these are different methods of collecting data if you were to think about it. So this study was done on interviews and uh, interviews and surveys where um, different questions were asked in terms of privacy. Some inspiration was drawn from Western study also uh, to collect this data. So this is the study which is privacy in India attitudes and awareness. 
I will just walk you through some interesting parts of this uh, report only again it may be interesting for you to take a look at it. One example, one motivational example was this uh, uh, thing about uh, railway. Uh, so, if you go to a railway station uh, where, where you can actually see the uh, chart and in, in train every every compartment will have uh, these many number of uh, these pieces of information there right which is your first name last name gender uh, from where you are starting in the train to where you are going to go into the train all of that it is uh, this this kind of information I mean is is it is it necessary to have it there? Uh, can somebody misuse this information? All of that is a big question to ask, right? This this information, for example, you could actually start having interesting conversations with people in the uh, in your compartment, knowing that where they're going and and uh, from where they're going to where they're going. Which otherwise the train is also uh, probably from that you can get it. Uh, but gender, age, all of that, is that necessary to put it out on the uh, public in that compartment? It's a question that you can ask, right? So, this study uh, focused on, so if you look at it, this study was done with 407 people, some distribution of uh, uh, characteristics uh, of the users who fill the data which is age, gender, education, income, profession, just to get a sense. But let's look at some results. So here is one uh, result which shows that uh, general and internet privacy concern in India compared to 1998. So unfortunately, this data was collected in 2004 and um, there was no data to compare within India at that point in time, right? So therefore, the 1998 survey, which was uh, done in the U.S., uh, was compared. Uh, if you look at India, where, so one question, which is general privacy and internet privacy, uh, India general privacy concern uh, is here, right? And uh, India internet privacy concerns are here. USA general privacy, internet privacy. What does this mean? This basically means that very concerned, how many people are very concerned about uh, a general privacy? General privacy is a question that I showed you earlier in the Western study, uh, is uh, very concerned 24 percent of the participants in India are actually very concerned about uh, uh, general privacy compared to 39% in uh, in the U.S. Internet privacy about 38% are uh, concerned, very concerned in India compared to 39%. Interesting, right? But please remember the comparison is between 2004 in India and 1998 in the U.S. Right? We just have to keep that in mind. So, if you look at it, general general impressions that you will get is that internet privacy uh, privacy concerns in India is lesser compared to the 1998 privacy concerns in the U.S. That's one of the conclusions that came out of this uh, research, and and particularly if you if you look at some specific. Uh, Data levels of concern, levels of concern sharing different data with websites. So, if you look at it, health information, right? Uh, health information, India, uh, percentage of people always feel comfortable about data, sharing the data. Health is so high, right? 29% are okay with sharing their health information, whereas compared to 6% in the US, right? So this is just to give you, and and these are things that you want to keep in mind also because these are kind of information that will keep coming back in the class, uh, which are also called as PII, which is personally identifiable information, right? Some of them, okay.
yeah similarly you will see in other other parts also where where uh, india uh, data uh, privacy concerns is much lesser. So keeping this in mind, if you were to think about what would be the privacy indices for India, which is fundamentalist, pragmatist, and unconcerned, it'll be interesting to find these kind of numbers, right? So that's privacy in India. First study, and a similar study was done with a large set of users. Uh, in 2011 and 2012 with 10,427 participants, supposedly one of the largest study on privacy, uh, quantitatively studying the attitudes and um, um, perceptions of users uh, about privacy in India. In this study, the large number of questions from Western uh, was uh, used about 83 questions were used in the study I think and this question this study had uh, all the interviews uh, FGD and survey I highly recommend you to go take a look at the um, take a look at the uh, report from from this link and and see because it's quite a long report and also the questions that are used are also interesting giving some scenarios. All right. So that's the report. Um, again, I'm using it only to show what kind of data is there and what some, some, this is a, 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 a interview study that data was collected and then there was also focus group discussions that was done. Uh, in terms of studying uh, privacy, asking questions about different uh, topics, and uh, all all data being given here, which is uh, for the interviews, uh, for the focus group discussions, and data that is this is percentage of uh, uh, data uh, from each part of uh, India. Uh, proportion of data that was collected from different parts of India, except for few cities, I think, few cities and states, data was collected from all other parts of India. So that's 10,427 uh, participants. That's a large amount of data. All this data is also publicly available. Uh, feel free to look at uh, uh, the data also if you're interested in, if you're interested in taking a look at the uh, analysis. So that gives you a sense of again um, quantitatively how to study actually privacy in India, uh, privacy perceptions and attitudes in India. This is just one perspective, right? Uh, so just a test for you. This this is part of the study also. Uh, so just a test for you. For, meaning I think you do it yourself as you uh, as you hear the lecture. Uh, what do you feel about privacy of your personal information on your OSN? OSN here, keep it as uh, whatever your favorite social network is. Let's take if it's Facebook. Right. Uh, it is. Uh, it is not a concern. So this is not ten thousand four twenty seven, but it's six thousand eight fifty five because not everybody because this was a physical form uh, only for a bar thousand people it was actually online rest of the nine thousand actually filled it in physical form uh, so they could actually skip the questions uh, it says uh, it is not a concern at all since I specified my privacy settings my data is secure even though I have specified my privacy settings I have concern I'm concerned about my privacy of my data it is a concern, but I still share personal information. It's a concern, and so I do not share the data on OSI. Right? So just think about it, right? If you if you were to uh, uh, get 100 people to fill this data, uh, this question, what would the percentage be? And make a note of it as you are uh, listening to this lecture, and put some numbers here. I hope you put, you can pause it and then put the number. And now uh, let me show you what the actual numbers were, right? So it's not a concern at all, it's about close to 20%. 20% of 
20 percent of the people think that look i don't really have any concern with the uh, facebook's and twitter's having my data it will be super interesting to know how these numbers change particularly given the situation now about people watching social data on great act for the for the students in the class it's probably biased uh, if you are listening to this lecture and if you if we were to fill this question i'm pretty sure uh, the numbers are very different from us compared to let's take somebody uh, who you are uh, at, at at home in a society that you live or your classmates that you're uh, studying with if you just do the same data collection uh, the numbers may be very different this is 19 and look at this this is 42 percent which says since i've specified my privacy settings my data is secure from a privacy breach last question like this if you if you receive a friendship uh, request on your most frequently used online social network which of the following people will you add as friends right uh, keep it keep it for now on facebook i guess a uh, person of opposite gender again the list of uh, options were much longer this is only to illustrate some point from the data that was collected person of opposite gender people from my hometown person with nice profile picture it says just a nice profile picture is enough i don't really care about uh, who the person is uh, strangers people whom you don't know somebody who you do not know or recognize, but have mutual or common friends and anyone. Pause the video and then put some numbers for let's take 100%. I assume you have added some percentages for uh, these roads. Now let's look at what the percentage, actual percentage that uh, was collected from the data. This is uh, person with opposite gender is 27%. Two percent is anyone. I don't really care about who's sending the request. I'll just keep accepting the request that is coming in. Person with a nice profile picture is just ten ten point one two percent. So that's a large number of people who are actually uh, accepting friend request uh, that is coming in. Most of you probably. If you are thinking about um, this, uh, most of you will fo probably fall into this category, which is, look, I don't know the person, but you know what? There are 74 people that are in mutual friends. And of that, I know the six people who are very careful about picking their friends and uh, Facebook or Insta. And therefore, I'm, it's, it's perfectly fine for me to actually accept the request. I'm sure that's a very common rational uh, that we give while making the decision. Uh, this this cartoon was extremely popular in the 90s, uh, which is on the internet. Uh, it says on the internet, nobody uh, knows you are a dog. You thought that on the internet, nobody knew you were a dog, uh, and then and then but then you you started getting personalized ads for your favorite brand of dog food right just to argue the point that uh, look uh, i think at some point in time we feel like we were anonymous even now i think many of us will feel like oh something that i do nobody will get noticed i will actually delete my cookies i will do incognito blah 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 all that right so there is, there is those kind of, of course, those kind of features are available now, which probably was not available when this cartoon was made. Um, and, uh, but, but this is definitely what it was in the 1990s.